There are kingdoms and companies that are the Switzerlands of the internet. These are data havens, and the information they host on the servers only they have access to are amongst the most secure, impenetrable, and inaccessible places on Earth. Some of these kingdoms and companies offer cyber criminals the privacy to conduct illegal information exchanges, malware attacks, spam dumps, ransomware breaches, and bulletproof hosting. Criminals have walked these halls. Here today, gone tomorrow, emerging outside the reach of law enforcement and between international legislations. We're visiting some of the most dangerous places on the internet to find out where cybercrime goes to hide. We're flying over the North Sea to see the world's first data haven. The Principality of Sealand, which considers itself a sovereign country, is an abandoned World War II gun platform. You're the Prince of Sealand. I am, yeah. I mean, it was the fort was situated in international water, and my grandfather decided, why not declare it a principality? Yeah. So, what is it about having your own kingdom that's so appealing? Yeah, I mean, it's the element of freedom that we have out there. Yeah. What we want without prying eyes watching our every move. Why don't you want prying eyes watching your, watching your every move? Why, why wouldn't you, did you say? I mean, why just shut your curtains at home? Seems like a long way to go to store your data. Yeah, well, some people go to long measures, don't they, to secure what this is. At the dawn of the internet, an idealist named Ryan Lackey founded the world's first online sovereign state by creating a bulletproof data hosting facility. The idea of Havenco was to have a place where people could host servers for internet sites and the users would be located everywhere in the world and these servers would be located on Sealand in a physically secure environment and we would have very high technical quality service but we would also be able to let the customer pick which laws applied to them. Oh, so, so is Ryan Lackey involved in Havenco anymore? No, uh, he, uh, he had a little bit of a falling out with us. No, no. What, what was the falling out about? Uh, primarily, he, we sort of dis disagreed, as I say, on the, the grey areas as far as when we were hosting for Haven Co originally. They, he wanted absolute carte blanche, do what you wanted. Uh, if someone wanted to come out there and operate a server selling firearms or missiles, he thought we should just offer a service to anyone that wanted it. We built the uh, business, so we got to make our own rules. Anyone who creates something gets to define what that thing is, which is part of why we picked the kind of regulations we did. We found a story about another bulletproof hoster, Cyberbunker, a Cold War nuclear bunker in the south of Holland that was built to withstand a 20 megaton blast. Have you seen a, a large black building, like a nuclear bunker? Middag. He knows the bunker. Yeah, he knows it. So they're telling me it used to be like a drug lab. Right. Oh, a yeah. bunker. A bunker. A bunker. Oh, yeah. You don't uh, go to it. Oh, no. You don't. It's forbidden. It's... I'm not quite sure if this was a good idea. Cyberbunker was a notorious hoster for illegal materials, especially spam. It was also rumored to be home to numerous hackers. A battle is waging across the internet. It's under the worst ever cyber attack. So strong, it's slowing down internet access globally. It's allegedly a strike from a Dutch web hosting company called Cyberbunker. Could somebody go to prison over this? Could somebody be fined? Is this going to be resolved? I doubt that the people that did the attacks are in any country where doing a DDoS attack is legal or where they can even be found. You know it's illegal what you're doing, right? After weeks of cryptic responses about whether we could actually get into Cyberbunker, I decided to try my luck. There was a face scanner at the door. It was clear that someone had also been using the facility quite recently. There were fresh coffee grounds in the trash and an empty server rack had seemingly just been delivered. 
It became obvious that someone may have been inside at that very moment watching us. We decided it was probably time to leave. Just when we thought that getting inside was a lost cause, I managed to get in touch with a convicted hacker who knew the owners of Cyberbunker, and the meeting was set. Raymond. Raymond, nice, nice to meet you. you. Hi, Aiden. Roy. Roy, nice, nice to, to meet you. you. How are you doing? You're welcome. Fine. So Fine. you're welcoming me into Cyberbunker? Oh, that's, that's, that's the wrong fact, name. That's in fact not the oh, name. Oh, that's anymore. the not. What's the name now? Uh, uh, it has a it has a code. Right. Yeah. What's the code? NL zero one. This is uh, the nuclear blast doors. Yeah. Of course, you're in the nuclear bunker. So. Yeah. What What's the phone signal like down here? None. No. None. So these are your CCTV cameras yeah. you've got around the place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we did notice. Them. I did try to get in the other day. Yeah. The only thing that I would say is it does say dog outside the gate, but there was no dog. We have silent dogs. Access granted. It's incredible, this is straight out of it, strange love. So uh, this was built to protect against Russian nuclear threat. Yep. Uh, and now we're in the cyber world, and it's again providing right. the protection. Right. Uh, so you're doing a full circle. So we came here looking for cyber bunker. This no. isn't cyber bunker anymore. No. Uh, our company is based upon trust. We want to provide high-end security for clients that are, well, trusting us with their most valuable data. And we are combining it with cybersecurity capabilities and we're telling that it's not just concrete or an EMP shield that yeah. helps you out in yeah. terms of securing, but it's also protecting the fiber and uh, mm -hmm. the cryptography and all those stuff from nowadays. Yeah. So with all the trends like cloud and big data and Internet of Things, that there's solely focus on Cybersecurity and let's say the, the digital part of securing data. Yeah. But you're um, doing the physical part as no, well. No, we're doing both. But um, why do you need the physical part? Who's actually going to break in here? Come on. And it, well, here, no one. If you're a company, you're storing your stuff here that, that you don't want anyone else to get their fingers on. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here So you don't cyberbunker. store everything in a bunker? We don't have a concept that relies on one bunker because okay. one bunker is no bunker. Yeah. So you have at least two in one country yeah. and then other bunkers in other countries, which yeah. gives you a also advantages from a legislation perspective, from data protection laws and what's more beneficial for clients to have that data in. So who are you providing uh, data storage for? Uh, currently, uh, we're not entitled to say. Okay. Uh, well, uh, typical, let's say, in generic terms, governments. Uh, but so, so potentially, governments might want to store their information here because it's a safe place from military attack from other governments. You might want to launch cyber attacks. For sure, we don't brag about locations. Yeah. We don't show pictures and movies from the inside. Yeah. Because in the end, that's that's not what clients are looking for: ultimate security, yeah. high-end security. Yeah. This will probably be the first and last time you will see this bunker from the inside. It seemed Cyber Bunker had evolved from a place where scammers and hackers go to hide to a place where governments and corporations do the same. There's different types of bulletproof hosting and it depends on if you're a criminal or if you're legitimate or you just need your data in cold storage, you pick the bulletproof hoster who was best for your needs. I wanted to see an active data haven, one that touted its ultra-secure hosting. Embedded in a nuclear bunker 30 meters below the hills of Stockholm is a hoster called Barnhof. This facility hosted WikiLeaks at the height of their prominence. If ever there was a place to securely keep your data, data that people want to get their hands on, this was the place. Hey, hi. Hi, nice to meet you. I met CEO Jon Carlo, and he gave me a tour of the impressive facility. Uh, it's a blast door. Is the physical impenetrability of this bunker even relevant? It's important. I mean, if you operate mission critical uh, business, it's important to have it secured by physical means. You need uh, energy, yeah. which is the, the diesel engines. Yeah. 
then you need internet, yeah. which is uh, fiber optic cables, and they are coming in from, from many ways. Is it a closely guarded secret where these cables are? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Jon showed me where WikiLeaks servers had been, and he walked me up to the control room overlooking the facility. It felt a little like being in a James Bond villain's lair. Back in London, I met with James Ball, who used to be a data analyst at WikiLeaks. Hey, how you doing? Good to meet you. Good to meet you. How's it going? Sounds his right hand man. Oh, I wouldn't quite say that, <laughs> but yeah. So, kind of WikiLeaks's famous server was this server in Sweden, um, a company called Barnhof, which is essentially, you know, in an underground bunker and hyper secure. Was Barnhof effective? I, t I tend to think stuff like Barnhof is a bit more theatre than anything else. You can have as secure a server nowhere near a bunker or an underground as in it, and most of the stuff that's actually going to catch you out isn't going to be someone drilling into an underground vault James Bond style. Is there any, anything illegal down there? Uh, it could be, but it, it is be. not, yes, but it's not my, I mean, I don't open at any given moment. Yeah. There can always be some illegal material on the internet, but yeah. I don't open the boxes. I don't control what's on the boxes. Uh, I think we are uh, the mailman, we are the bank. The hosters would like to see themselves as the post office, but if they really want to be a post office, they have to act on abuse complaints when they come in. Mm. A post office doesn't have, like if a post office had a bomb mm. stored in their post office and they didn't yeah. take action uh, when they got a complaint, they'd be out of business. Uh, so bulletproof hosting is a term that's gone back maybe 10 or 15 years and it refers to a hoster who will not take action to take down your website. So somebody discovers that you, your website at that hosting provider is bad and they go to the hosting provider and say, can you disconnect this customer or can you uh, give me information about what that customer is doing because they've, they've, stolen, they've stolen my data mm -hmm. and the company will just ignore those abuse complaints. I was told corrupt hosters in Southeast Asia favor smoke and mirrors over hardened data centers. We found one such hoster, so we decided to track them down. Their registered address took us to a nondescript apartment complex in the suburban outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. It's a residence. Yeah. This is just like someone's flat, right? This, uh, the sixth level is all residences, so probably it's a residence office. Uh, yes. hello. Oh, hello. hello. We were just wondering about the, um, your neighbours. Yes. Cinepak. But you, you say they haven't been here for... Three years. They haven't been here for three yeah. years. Yeah, since I stay here, no. No one's, no one's there. Uh -huh. We went to a place today um, called uh, Cinepak. We went to the location which was on their website and there was no one there and the neighbours said they hadn't been there for around three years. So there will be one specific group of people. They are, they are very, uh, very uh, specialised in uh, web hosting business, in, in the hosting business. So what they do is they set up different companies, they take different orders and then uh, once uh, the company being, uh, being uh, stopped being crammed down, they will start another company in other places, different provider and then uh, they will take a new orders again until they got the same complaint, and then they will stop, and then they will start another company. Right, kind of like nomad hosting in a way. Yeah, from it's one going from to place to yeah. place to yes. place until yeah. there are so many complaints, they move on to the next one. Yeah. So, what's the extent of cybercrime in Malaysia? Is it a big problem right now? I think the majority is on uh, fraud and uh, phishing attacks, so uh, that is what uh, that is what we are seeing. I think uh, mid last year, there's a bunch of uh, claim to be a uh, uh, South South uh, African which uh, they managed to get access to uh, the local ATM machines. So they managed to withdraw money like what, uh, 30, 30 million ringgit from the uh, different ATM machines uh, throughout Malaysia. But they hacked the, the cash machine. The cash machine, yes. A company called Ecatel that was rumored to have ties to bulletproof hosting and cybercrime popped up on our radar. We had information on their current location, so we boarded a flight to The Hague to track them down. Oh, hi, is that Ecatel? Oh, I'm just looking to host um, some data on, on a server. I, th I heard Ecatel was a good place to do that. I've got eclectic tastes, so I thought Ecatel might be the place. Oh, well, I d it, was, it was just sort of in the ether, your telephone number. 
Their offices are in The Hague, okay. Oh, hi, I've got an appointment with Ecatel. Can you let me in? Hi, could you buzz me in? I've got an appointment with Ecatel. Thanks. Now you're shutting up in it. Huh? You don't come in. Do you know Ecatel? No, no never oh. Ecatel's not here. Oh, oh. I'm so sorry. So how do you know? You just... I know they're in the Hague. Is this, is, this your, is this your building? Go away. Is it your building? Oh, is it? Go away. Is it your building? Please go away. Why, what, can I not come and see Ecatel if I've got an appointment? Yep. But how, just wondering if they've got their service here. Don't take any pictures of me. Okay. Don't make me angry. Yeah. Look, we heard there was some nasty stuff on Ecatel servers. If there is anything on the servers that's not normal, yeah. not, not right, mm. then it's removed. And any abuse yeah. they receive yeah. will be dealt with by by Ecatel. By Ecatel. Oh, that's yeah. good, so they're policing themselves. Stay away from me. OK, sorry. I'm not your f friend. OK, all right. OK. To understand the magnitude of bulletproof hosting, I found myself talking to some of the most secretive people on the internet. A patriotic activist that goes by the name of Jester agreed to chat. He's been known for taking down jihadist websites across the world and hacking into the personal email accounts of Iran's president. I was seeing a giant uptick in jihadis using the internet to recruit, radicalize, and even train online. I felt I should do something about it. Why would people want to use bulletproof hosting? I suppose hackers' tools are servers. They need places to launch attacks from. Bulletproof hosting is a valuable service for me. I'm under constant attack. I care more about the provider being impenetrable to cyber over physical attacks. Well, if I want to be a bulletproof hoster in the true sense of the word, I would distribute all my information all over the place. I wouldn't rely on a single server in a single bunker. I wouldn't rely on a single jurisdiction. All right, basically I want to distribute it to a point where a single takedown of a single location does not disrupt my ability to host or to basically put anything out there. So nowadays the most effective form of bulletproof hosting isn't necessarily being in a bunker, it's being in the cloud, hiding in plain sight. Yes, exactly. Uh, it's not necessary that you have a bunker or some very secure location. The idea is that you pretend like you're not doing anything illegal at all and you just sign up for regular hosting like a regular customer and then the task is to try and mask the fact that you're, you're actually a criminal enterprise. And how do you mask? So the way they mask is they take multiple hops before a victim is sent to the final destination. And those hops are generally in different countries to make it difficult for law enforcement to get cooperation from all those countries in order to find out where the hosting is behind that. It's totally a war. Cyberspace is the new theater. We're seeing this more and more now every day. The Silicon Valley startup is caught in the middle of a cyber war between ISIS and the hacking group known as Anonymous. The company is called Cloudflare. It's a startup that protects websites against denial of service. Those are attempts to bring websites down. But it does not discriminate with its clients. It has come out and said that. Anonymous is lashing out at Cloudflare for shielding pro-ISIS sites from the hacking group's attacks. Cloudflare, it frustrates me. frustrates all of us, even though, you know, we, we, do, we do have to use it to protect our site, but it's an American company and they're protecting many, many of the ISIS websites now. Now I work at a company, Cloudflare, which is the edge of the internet. It connects between your browsers and your servers from, every, from multiple locations around the world. So is Cloudflare the future of bulletproof hosting? Uh, it is the future of how you reliably host internet content mm. uh, without censorship. Anonymous have recently ac accused you of having uh, two of the top three ISIS websites. Yeah, I don't, that I can't really talk about. You can't talk about yeah, that, yeah. right. Contacted Cloudflare directly, daily, 
alerting them, them to this and just get no response. What gives Anonymous the right to say what should and shouldn't be online to make judgments? Have you seen the ISIS material? When I see a head cut off because someone prayed the wrong way or they're gay, I think that gives me the right. I'll make that judgment call. Do hosters have a moral responsibility when it comes to what's out there on the internet? I think it is very much their responsibility. Guides for homegrown terror cells on how to shoot up a room and successfully go carry out another attack before suiciding oneself should not be easily available to people online. If you just take the I will host everything, you're really facilitating some dark stuff and you're actually endorsing it. I think you have to actually get in the, the weeds, you have to get in the case by case and go, there is a ton of stuff that I hate you're making, that I would never do anything with. You're making hosters incredibly responsible for the content. I mean, that hosters are incredibly responsible for the for what they're because hosting a hoster, it for. Because that's a, that's why they that's why they want to be blind hosts. So criminals need bulletproof hosting because they need to be able to keep their website up. Because if they're on your computer and they're stealing your credit card or your emails, they need to send that information somewhere. And those type of bulletproof hosters they understand that there's criminal activity happening on their servers and they just want to get paid. These guys have got billions and you don't. These guys have got hundreds and hundreds of computer scientists and most of us don't. You've got to know how not to be scammed. You've got to trust everyone you give your data to. So we have to actually just take personal responsibility for our own online security. I think we need to force companies to take responsibility for our data that they have, and we have to take responsibility for our data that we have overall. There's no absolute solutions, essentially. It's constant give and take. There's, there's no magic bullet, there's no magic server. We are going to have to work this out for ourselves.